Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this AROC webinar on how to interpret your benchmark report. Um, during this webinar, we'll be looking at an impairment specific report with the aim of providing information on how to interpret the graphs in your benchmark reports. The impairment specific reports should be considered in conjunction with the benchmark core reports and the relevant target outcomes reports for your service. So the report we are going to be using today is the calendar year 2018 AROC impairment specific report for stroke. And we're using the Anywhere Hospital, which can be accessed through our website. So Anywhere Hospital is a made up facility that uses AROC data. Um, it's designed to be used by services who don't have enough episodes or other people who may be interested in seeing the national data. Each service can download their reports uh, through AROC online services, the AOS. And if you have any issues downloading reports, please contact us. Um, my name is Nicole Rankin, and um, I'm here with Elise White, who is, we are going to do half the presentation each today. Okay. <laughs> so each report starts off with a, a table of contents breaking up the report. Um, so there is a dashboard, an information section on the data that's used in the report. If applicable, there's particular impairment codes and ANSNAP classes that are used. Then we look at the big picture of comparing services to national data, focus on some FIM scoring and some outcomes analysis, in, um, including impairment specific data items, and then some explanatory data. You can also see in the appendices, there is a glossary, which provides you a lot of definitions of terms that we use, as well as a complete list of the AROC impairment codes and the ANSNAP classes. Um, this is the dashboard, so I won't go through the dashboard as there was a webinar run this morning about how to interpret data on your, web, on your dashboard report. If anyone did miss that webinar, a recording will be available on our website in the near future. So if we move through to data used in this report, so this will give you some indication of, of what we have used. So it's completed episodes in the reporting period of January to December, 2018. It will talk about your benchmark group, which is your national data that you can be compared to. This will be Australia or New Zealand, and will include all services with data on the impairment, so in this case, stroke. The unit of counting, um, as with all AROC reporting, um, is by episode, not by patient. And services will only receive this report when there is a minimum of 20 completed episodes within the particular impairment. So in this report, because it's stroke, we list out the um, impairment codes that are used in the analysis. And then we list out the particular ANSNAP classes. So ANSNAP is the classification used in rehab. Okay, so then we go into the big picture. So the first graph is a quite simple graph just showing the volume of stroke episodes with each bar representing here the 260 services with at least one episode of stroke reported. 152 of these particular services reported strokes between 20 and 243 episodes. Here we have a stacked bar graph and this is split into looking at your facility across the top and your benchmark group, in this case, Australia, across the bottom. In the middle is the legend for the colours. So these are the ANSNAP classes. And the colour coding provides an easy visual way to compare your services to national data. We have the impairment groups on the left-hand side with a number of episodes in brackets and the proportion of your episodes across the bottom on the horizontal axis. So for example, here, in impairment group 1.1 hemorrhagic stroke, your service has 26 episodes compared to 2,946 uh, nationally. And that makes up um, about 27% of your hemorrhagic strokes in ANSNAP class 4AA1, which are those least functionally impaired strokes. If we look at Australia, it's about 21%, so you're slightly higher. Behind each graph um, is a table of data that supports it and um, provides you with the number of episodes. There are many tables of data after graphs in this particular report, and I won't go through each one as we work our way through. 
but it is important when reviewing your reports to look at these tables in conjunction with the graphs. We just talked about um, ANSMAP class 4AA1 and your proportion being higher than the national. But if you look here, you actually only had seven episodes compared to 616 nationally. Um, it is important to note in all reports that the proportions can be easily influenced when there are only small numbers of cases. Here we have proportions of episodes by ANSNAP class. So on the left hand side here are the episodes. We have your facility represented in purple and um, your benchmark group for Australia represented in the light green bars. It's very easy to do a comparison. We then have the same graph, however this time it is split into your impairment groups. So in this example, proportionally, your service and Australia are very similar. These are stacked 100% bar charts and they are used to present a time series. So in the example here, we have the ANSNAP classes in the middle as the legend with the colours. We have the years of data for your facility here on the left hand side and for Australia here on the right hand side and the numbers of episodes are represented under each year. Okay, so in this example, you can note that the proportions um, for Australia remain fairly consistent over the years. However, the proportions for your facility have varied. For example, um, and SNAP class 4AA2, which is represented by this green colour here, has varied and has had a, a major decrease here in 2015, for instance. If you want to examine that further, you could then have a look at the actual number of episodes. Next, we're looking at the proportion of episodes by impairment group. And again, this is over time. This table here is a summary of incomplete episodes. Um, this presents including your reasons why. So remembering that an incomplete episode are those where there has been an interruption to the rehab program and the patients have been transferred back to acute. Next, we look at review of FIM item scoring by ANSNAP class. So I'm sure a majority of you would be familiar with the FIM splat graphs. Uh, these are a graphic presentation of functional status um, displayed as a radar chart. Here you have the 18 items, um, FIM items arranged as spokes of the wheel and the scoring levels go from one total dependence to seven total independence and they run from the centre outwards. The mean FIM score for each item is indicated and it is for your facility is in the green dotted line and the red line is for um, your benchmark group, in this case Australia. Here we are comparing the admission FIM scores and the discharge FIM scores as two different figures. Um, so these FIM splats at this level present an overall view of your services admission FIM score and discharge FIM scores at a very high level compared to the national. Next, we go on to looking at them by each particular ANSNAP class. So in this particular ANSNAP class for AA1, okay, which is your least impaired strokes, you can see that the FIM splats in your service are very similar to the national for both admission and discharge scoring. If we then look at ANSNAP class 4A83, for example, you can notice that for uh, social interaction, for instance, you have a higher admission score than the national um, and also in relation to the stairs FIM item. If we look at the discharge FIM scores, however, um, you can see that there isn't much difference at all. It is also important to note here that for this particular ANSNAP class, this facility only has five episodes. 
compared to nationally 545 episodes. And just to show you another example, for ANSNAP class 4AA7, here we're only showing national data. This is because for your facility, you have less than five episodes. So it will still appear in your, in your report, but it will only show the national data. Okay, so if we go on to outcomes analysis, um, look at completed episodes by ANSNAP class and impairment. So this is an overall view at the beginning um, of the number of completed episodes. So it will give you the number of episodes in those complete and a percentage as well for your facility um, and for your national benchmark group. And it will give you the ANSNAP classes and the impairment groups. Okay, case mix adjusted relative means. So this is for length of stay and for FIM change for your service. Comparison of such statistics such as length of stay and FIM change are only possible if the groups being compared are made up of similar patients. So for example, if your facility treats all the heavy strokes and my service only treats the light strokes, we can't compare our two services for length of stay or FIM change as it's not a fair comparison. So what AROC does is control for the mix of cases at each service so that the remaining differences are most likely to be due to process differences. If you want any more further reading or further information on case mix just relative mean, it is contained in the glossary in the appendices of your report. If we're looking at this graph, the line at zero here represents what length of stay we would have expected you to achieve given your mix of cases. Here we can see where the red circle line is your length of stay. So your service's length of stay is negative 1.5 days, which means that on average, your patients had a shorter length of stay than expected given your case mix. We can also see looking at the FIM change, your service is negative 1.7, which indicates that your service is achieving less functional improvement than expected given your case mix. At the bottom of the graph, we can see a data table which will give you the FIM change and length of stay with the 95% confidence intervals for your service and national data. And there's also a definition of confidence interval in the glossary as well for your information. The next graph is a case mix adjusted relative means and it's over time. So this is over a four year period from 2014 to 2018, five year period, sorry. Um, so as you can see, the length of stay, for example, which here up here in the legend is the red circle line, has been decreasing over time. The line zero in the middle is your expected, um, expected outcome for your um, for your service, sorry, for your case mix service. And as you can see, the functional in, um, thin change here has been hovering around that line, but in the last 12 months has actually decreased. So on average, your patients have a shorter length of stay than they have had in previous years. However, your patients have had, a, have had less functional improvement than expected in the last 12 months, given your case mix. This next graph is looking at outcome measures and we are comparing against national here, so either Australia or New Zealand. The big thing to note about this graph, this is affectionately called the DNA graph, is that this is raw data, so this is not case mix adjusted data. Um, the graph shows your service outcome measures, which are here on the left-hand side, um, and how they compare with the national, which is shown here. And we also have in brackets um, what those outcome measures are for the national, which here is Australia. Um, the vertical number zero here 
is the national outcome measure and your average, it, it compares your facility to that. So you can see anything on the left hand side of the graph is lower than Australia. Anything on the right um, hand side of the graph is higher than Australia. So for example, the average age in years um, of patients in rehab is 73.4 years in 2018, while those at your service are approximately a year older on average. We can see here that your average length of stay is about four days shorter than the national length of stay, and your FIM efficiency is slightly higher than the national figure. This is the same graph again, however, this is just for your facility and how it has changed in regards to the previous year, and this year would be 2017. So here we can see your length of stay is lower, your FIM efficiency is slightly higher, and the biggest thing here to note, I guess, is the, is the, in, the higher percentage of patients that you have discharged to private residence compared to your previous year. This is another time series graph displaying average length of stay in days, on the left hand side here, um, by ANSNAP class. Each ANSNAP class is represented up the top here in the legend by a different colour line and shape. Your service is displayed here on the left hand side and Australia is here on the right hand side. Um, note at the bottom of the page will tell you that this graph only includes completed episodes with valid length of stay and those where there were five episodes or more. So you may find some ANSNAP classes are missing. As you can see, the national averages for each ANSNAP class remain fairly consistent over time. However, the variability for your services graph could be explained by lower volume. For example, ANSNAP class 4AA7 here has a dramatic increase in its average length of stay in 2016. This, pot this potentially could be just due to one particular episode with a very long length of stay. This type of bar chart is showing your average length of stay by ANSNAP class for both your facility in purple and Australia in the light green. Um, we have down here your services episodes in brackets with a total number of all stroke here on the right hand side for your service as 74 episodes. You will notice that there is no bar shown for ANSNAP class 4AA7 and 4AZ4. This is because your volume was less than five episodes. These black lines on the graphs here are called 95% confidence interval whiskers, and they indicate the variation in data around the averages. These whiskers will be wide, where the number of episodes are small, and will be quite narrow, where the numbers of episodes are large, such as in the national data. Here we are looking at case mix adjusted length, mean length of stay by ANSNAP class. So here we have this line zero again, which represents where we would have expected your length of stay to be, given your mix of cases. This example shows a number of ANSNAP classes where the length of stay is shorter than expected, that is below the line. However, it is important to note that the number of episodes in these can be small. Here we have, now we're looking at average length of stay by impairment group. So again, this is the raw data. And then we have the case mix adjusted length of stay by impairment group. And you can see that your facility's length of stay overall, case mix adjusted length of stay is shorter than expected for your case mix. Looking again at the uh, average FIM change by ANSNAP class over time. So we then look at this by ANSNAP class where they have many variations and this can again be due to, due to small numbers. And again, the average FIM change by ANSNAP class 
national versus your facility. And here we have the mean fin change by NSNAP class again. Your zero line is your expected due to your case mix, expected functional improvement due to your case mix with a number of classes below the line. And this may indicate that your parent, your patients are achieving less than expected functional improvement. For example, uh, ANSNAP class 4AA5, your service has achieved a greater FIM change than expected. However, there are only five episodes in that class. If we look at overall for all stroke episodes, your service is achieving just, below, just lower FIM change than expected given your case mix. Okay, so this one is the case mix adjusted relative main length of stay and now we've used age groups along the horizontal axis instead of ANSNAP classes or impairment groups. So looking at this graph you can see the under 60s age group. Your service has a slightly shorter length of stay than expected whereas nationally the length of stay is actually longer than expected. This is the same graph again, however, we are now looking at fin change by age group. And in the under 60s group, if we use that example again, you're achieving similar to Australia here, which is a slightly higher than expected fin change. Um, and again, you've got your tables at the end. Now I'll hand over to Elise. We'll take you through the explanatory data. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, now we're going to move into a section of the report that looks at um, explanatory data. The following graphs should be considered as part of the overall picture of rehabilitation outcomes. To give you a bit of context first, um, these graphs were developed following services interest in the impact of comorbidities and complications on length of stay and fin change. Clinicians were telling us that there was an impact on rehab outcomes where a comorbidity or complication was reported. But there was no definitive data to support their anecdotal evidence. So this graph here presents data for your service of the case mix adjusted relative mean length of stay represented by the red circles and the case mix adjusted relative mean FIM change represented by the blue diamonds. The number of comorbidities are listed here on the horizontal axis, and you can see the number of episodes reporting. One comorbidity here is 12, um, and three here is also 12. This is a national graph. Um, so we'll just look at this one as I have um, a higher volume of episodes. As you can see, this graph demonstrates that once a comorbidity is recorded, length of stay increases and fin change starts to decrease. We can see here, for example, that for patients with three comorbidities, their length of stay is just over three days longer and they have slightly less, they're achieving slightly less fin change. This is another graph looking at the impact the presence of comorbidities have on case mix adjusted length of stay. In this example, the comorbidities are listed here in the middle of the graph. Um, the right hand side presents data for Australia and the left presents your services data. The number of episodes are here on the left hand side of the graph um, and for Australia they're here. So for cardiac disease we can see Australia reported 1,669 episodes and this service um, reported 19 episodes. Uh, where there are less than five episodes reporting a comorbidity, the no value is shown on the graph, as you can see for these, for your service. Um, it's important again to remember to look at the number of episodes. For example, if you look at osteoarthritis, your case mix adjusted relative mean length of stay is 11 days longer compared to Australia. Mm. Um, however, your service only reported five episodes, whereas Australia reported 385 episodes. 
Here we are now looking at the impact on case mix adjusted relative mean fin change by comorbidity. As you can see here, your service achieved lower than expected fin change when an episode reported uh, comorbidity of cardiac disease. As well as keeping in mind the number of episodes, always make sure that you check the values. If you look here at the horizontal axis, you can see that the values differ between your service and Australia. An example of how this impacts how you read the graph is a bar for multiple sclerosis in Australia. Um, this shows a case mix adjusted film change of approximately negative 15, 15 points lower. lower yeah. um, however, the similar size bar for your service shows approximately seven points lower. The next set of graphs are the same we looked at earlier, but this time looking at complications and the impact on the case mix adjusted fin change and length of stay. So again, the length of stay is in the red and fin change is the blue diamonds. For your service and Australia, so this is Australia's graph, um, you can see that the higher the number of complications, the longer the case mix adjusted length of stay and the less the fin change they are able to achieve. This graph presents case mix adjusted relative mean length of stay by complication. And again, the complications are listed here in the middle of the graph. And here you can see your service only had two types of comorbidities, complications, sorry, um, with um, greater than five episodes. For Australia, you can see that when a co complication of UTI is reported, the case mix adjusted length of stay is on average about eight days longer. And again, this is the same graph, but now looking at case mix adjusted fin change by type of complication. Um, just important to note here again, the values along the horizontal axis when you're doing any comparisons. So this graph demonstrates where the patients lived prior to their inpatient episode, broken down by impairment group. So your service is here on the top and Australia is here on the bottom half. Um, here you can see the overwhelming majority of patients are admitted to hospital from a private residence, as demonstrated here by the blue shading. Residential aged care is in the green and then we have other in yellow just the data table following. Care status. So now we're moving into looking at care status. Um, so this is a key outcome measure for rehabilitation. Care status before and after rehabilitation can be compared as an indication of a patient's rehabilitation outcomes. This is a simple graphical representation of the breakdown of care status. And in this case, we are looking at those episodes admitted from a private residence. The legend is displayed here on the right hand side with the relevant colors. Um, and we can see here that the majority of patients admitted from private residence for both Australia and your service did not have a carer and did not needed one, need one as represented here by the gray bar. This graph shows the proportion of episodes receiving services prior to impairment by carer status comparing your service again to Australia. For your service, if we look at all episodes in private residence, 30% um, received services prior to their impairment, represented here by the grey bar. Um, and that's similar, close to um, what Australia, all episodes in private residence received. Um, Skip the data table. Um, this is the same type of graph, but this time grouping the number of services received prior to impairment by care status. All right. So this graph here provides a breakdown of the types of services received prior to impairment and compares your service here in the purple bars to Australia represented by the green bars. Here you can see the majority of the episodes for both 
your service and Australia receive domestic assistance for ITIL impairment. This graph analyzes the type of services received by care status. The care status is along the horizontal axis and the type of services received are here in the legend on the right hand side. And that's the data table supporting those graphs. Um, so a range of date items are collected to help provide further information about the processes of the rehab program. This graph represents, presents information about the average number of days from injury to acute admission. Um, the green indicates the number of days from the injury date to acute admission and the brown represents the days from the acute admission to rehab episode start. And it's broken down by ANSNAP class here along the left hand side with the number of episodes in brackets. If we look at an um, ANSNAP class 4AA6, for example, we can see that there was no delay between injury to acute admission and on average 21.7 days from acute admission to rehab episode start. There are some instances where we might understand why a delay might occur and others where you might expect there to be no delay between injury dates to acute admission. So a couple of examples here are, say if we have Mrs. Smith who was down at her local shops one morning and she had a stroke. We might expect that an ambulance would be called and Mrs. Smith would be taken straight up to the hospital. And in this case, there would be no delay between injury to acute admission. However, say for example, we have Mr. Jones who lives alone on his property. He fell, fractured his hip. It would likely take longer for him to get into hospital. And in this case, there would be a delay from his injury date to acute admission. These graphs um, were developed following services anecdotal evidence of long delays occurring from referral to rehab episode start. So the assessment date is the date the patient was first seen by a clinician or rehab team to assess the patient's appropriateness for rehab care. The patient is deemed clinically ready for rehab when the rehab physician or a physician with an interest in rehabilitation deems the patient ready to start the rehab program. And the episode start date is of course the date the patient actually started their rehab program. For your service, we can see that the average number of days between injury to referral is 10 days. Referral um, to assessment is 0.6 days. Uh, assessment to clinically ready is one day and clinically rehab ready to episode start is 0.8 days. And these are very similar to the Australian averages. The text below the bars show the percentage of episodes that had a delay in episode start from when they were deemed clinically ready. Um, and we can see for Australia, this was 18.2%. So here's the breakdown in the types of delays in episode start that were reported, with the majority of delays being service issues for both your service in purple here and Australia in green. Yeah, so for an example, um, a service issue might be that there were no beds available when the patient was deemed ready or there was no transport available to bring them into your service. Um, just a couple of exa examples there. Okay, this bar graph shows the average number of days from a patient being deemed clinically ready for discharge by the multidisciplinary team and the patient's actual discharge date. The top bar shows your service data um, and the text below the bar indicates that 7% of episodes experienced a delay in discharge of on average 2.8 days. So you can see for Australia that's a delay in 9.6% of 8.7 days on average. This graph details the type of delay in episode end and for your service compared to Australia you can see the largest proportion for Australia is external support issues. An external support issue might be you needed to provide um, education to a carer before the patient is safe to go home with them, or the carer or family isn't available to support the patient at home until after their planned discharge. 
they might have, say, gone on an impromptu holiday to Fiji that just happened to coincide with the discharge date. That one. So this graph presents the discharge destination by ANSNAP class. ANSNAP class is here on the left-hand side um, and proportions are here on the um, horizontal axis. The legend identifying the discharge destin destinations are here at the top of the graph. We can see in this graph that the overwhelming majority of episodes for Australia and your service are discharged to final accommodation as demonstrated here by the orange bars. You can see the less functionally impaired ANSNAP classes are more likely to be discharged to private residents than those with a more um, severe impairment um, as having a higher proportion remaining in hospital or being discharged to interim accommodation. The same graph is used here, but now we're looking at um, impairment group instead of ANSNAP class. So this graph compares the mode of episode N between your service and national data. The black and grey stacked bar show that the majority of patients are discharged back to the community. And the green and blue stacked bars show that when discharged back to the community, the majority of patients are discharged to their final accommodation. This graph details interim accommodation um, post-discharge, broken down by ANSNAP class. The destination are listed in the legend at the top of the screen. And you can see that due to low volume, the data for your service is only for one ANSNAP class and five episodes. A couple of examples of an interim destination is that a patient might be waiting for home mod modification to be made on their own home, so they have to stay with their son, or um, they might be discharged to their local hospital while they're waiting on services to be put in place. We can see here that the less functionally impaired are more likely to have private residence as an interim destination. This is the same graph um, now displayed by impairment group instead of ANSNAP class. And you can see here for Australia um, that the, it's pretty similar across all the impairment groups. All right, now we are looking at the breakdown of final accommodation by ANSNAP class. And again, majority of the episodes are discharged to private residents as you can see here in the blue. And this is the same graph, um, but now looking at impairment groups instead of ANSNAP class. All right, here we are looking at the interim and final accommodation um, post-discharge. The legend here in the middle of the graph give you, gives you the actual number of episodes for interim and final accommodation for your service. As an example, the largest proportion of episodes went to residential aged care as an interim destination. However, just note that it was only three episodes. It's useful in these circumstances to look at the data tables to provide a bit of context. These are the same graphs we discussed earlier, looking at care status prior to admission, but now we are looking at care status post-discharge as a comparison. The next graph is a breakdown of whether or not services were received by care status when admitted from a private residence post-discharge. Here we can see, oh sorry, when being discharged to a private residence. Um, here we can see the all episodes in private residence for both Australia and your service. So Australia here and your service here are pretty similar in that close to 70% of, episodes, of patients received services post-discharge and around 30% did not receive services post-discharged. Okay, this graph presents changes in accommodation and the level of support required post-discharge. The horizontal axis displays the accommodation prior to admission and the vertical axis gives a proportion of episodes. The legend detailed in the middle of the screen of the graph shows the level of change. For example, for Australia, for episodes admitted from a private residence with no care required, as indicated here by the grey section, 
these services had, these episodes had no change in accommodation or care required. The orange section shows those with a small decline. For example, the patient came in from private residence and might have been discharged back to private residence, but now needs a carer. The red section represents a large decline. So the patient might have come in from a private residence, but was discharged to a nursing home. This graph compares the number of different services required post-discharge by the patient's carer status. For Australia, for no carer and does not need one, the largest proportion here, shaded in grey, we can see by the legend, is for receiving one service type only. Here we are looking at a breakdown of the types of services received post-discharge, and clearly the largest proportion is allied health for both your service and Australia. In this graph, the displays for your service, um, now comparing services required pre and post rehabilitation program. So you can see the largest increases here is allied health with the prior being this brown color and the post um, being the blue color. <laughs> Okay, this is the types of services received. This is the same graph we looked at earlier. Um, um, now analyzing the type of services received post discharge by care status. For Australia, those patients with a care are not living in um, here. Um, they receive the same proportion of both domestic assistance and allied health, as can be seen here in the purple and gray bars, post-discharge. And that's the data tables to support that graph. And that brings us to the end of the report, um, which just has the appendix following that Nicole went over earlier. It just has the glossary followed by the impairment codes and the ANSAP classes. And then there is our contact details at the very end. We're going to open it up for if anyone has any questions they want to ask about the report, please just type into the chat. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you had any questions following the webinar. All right, we might leave it there. Um, as I said, you can send an email through and we're happy to help out. Thank you.